Hey, Heel Squad with Maria Menounos fans. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not Maria Menounos. It's Mr. Maria Menounos. Subbing in for my beautiful and talented wife. Bring you part two of our interview with scientist, musician, geologist, love, pioneer, uh, renaissance man, Greg Braden. And uh, Kelsey. Kevin. Mind-blowing part one, I think even more of a mind-blowing part two. Part two. Why don't you start us off with uh, with a quote? I got you. All right, this is from Greg Braden himself. I love this quote. The key to our transformation is simply this. The better we know ourselves, the better equipped we will be to make our choices wisely. And he kind of talks about that in part two, Kev. Really like knowing what it means to be fully human and evolution and how we're all connected yeah it's pretty it's pretty crazy no well, so i'm excited for y'all to listen it's uh it's heavy which is why we split into two parts and uh hopefully there's a lot of good takeaway for you in there as well and um yeah we'll definitely have them back for follow-up so if um please any questions that you think we left out let us know on patreon um and uh in the comments on our youtube section and if you are listening to us then please, by all means, give us that five-star rating and a really good review. All right, Kelsey, with that, let's do part two of our interview with Greg Braden, and then we'll, uh, we'll be back to say goodbye. Well, you right. had a great quote here that said, you know, it, for the last 150 years, we've been led to think that we are separate. You know, we asked, what can I get from the world that exists? And then you're saying now that, that we need to reframe to the new question is what I can offer to the new world that's emerging. Well, this is where the science comes in. And a lot of people try to keep science separate from everything else. We are the product of Darwinian thinking. Darwin published his book in 1859, The Origin of, it was titled On the Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. And when I share this with young people, we have a lot of young people come to our live programs. They say, okay, you know, cool. We get it. Darwin wasn't 100% right. But this is the 21st century. We've got the internet. We've got Facebook, you know, Instagram. So what? What difference does it make? And it's a really good question. They're surprised by the answer. Because the answer is that the foundations of the society we have today in the 21st century were laid down in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they were laid down based upon what was believed to be true during that time. Darwin said, survival of the strongest. And those are his exact words. Later, later they became survival of the fittest. They were interpreted by uh, an interview that he did with a newspaper. Survival of the fittest. His, I've got a copy of his original manuscript. Survival of the strongest. And that, that is a deep insight into his thinking. Our economic system that we have today was based in those ideas, the late 1800s, survival of the strongest. The financial system, the corporate system, the way corporations are, are organized. So it's like the biggest, toughest, the, almost the biggest bully wins, right? Yeah, like so did, you have it, to be like that. It, it is. So that was where in the 150 or so years, when we make choices in our lives, people will typically ask, what's in it for me? What can I get? Yeah. And so now <laughs> the new science is showing us that nature, the fundamental nature, uh, rule of nature, it's not competition and conflict. It is cooperation. Nature's fundamental rule is cooperation. And knowing that, that's where the shift in the question comes from. Rather than asking, what can I get from the world? When we ask, what can I give? What can I share? What can I contribute? That is a paradigm shift in the mind that begins to, it triggers us to think differently. It opens up a whole new array of, of possibilities. Can, can I give a concrete example rather Please. than the abstractions here? I love here? this. Yeah. Let me just, uh, this is just a really concrete example. I, uh, I live, my wife and I live in a rural community now in Northern New, New Mexico, outside of Santa Fe. I'm coming to you from a, a studio outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in the 2008 housing crash, a friend of mine here was a builder, a very successful builder of green homes, he had just taken on the largest contract for an entire community of green homes, hired, you know, uh, hundreds of people were relying upon him and the crash came and he lost all of it. He lost his business. 
he couldn't help those people. He had to let them I all saw go. That you talked about this in an interview. I want to buy one of his greenhouses now. Yeah, go well, ahead, continue. So, <laughs> so, so he was struggling. His name, his name was Ken, and he was Ken was struggling. And so when Ken tells the story, he says he woke up from a deep sleep about three o'clock in the morning on his lips. He was actually mouthing the words, "What do they need? What do people need?" He wasn't saying, "How am I going to keep my business going?" or "How am I going to make money?" He was saying, "What can people need?" And that is such a pivotal paradigm shift in thinking. Now, he was a contractor and a really good one. So he answered the question based upon what he knew, his skills. However, he was applying his skills in a different way. He said, people need water. They got plenty of water here in New Mexico. They need food. He said, maybe, maybe I can help people grow their own food. And so to make a long story brief, he took his contractor skills. He uh, he designed, and then he built the prototypes, and then he went into mass production of a series of modular, raised beds, self-watering, self-heating, year-round covered um, gardens that can be scaled from, from 12 inches by 12 inches to fit on a windowsill in a New York City high-rise to four feet by eight feet that can be used two or three. We have three of them uh, in a, a garden that we have just outside of uh, the property where I am right now. And he began to sell these and he was, he is today more successful with these than he was as a builder. He's hired more people. He, he cannot install them all himself any longer. So he has kits that now are available. Uh, it's called Grow Your Own is the, is the, the name of the, the website that he has. And it's an example of the shift, if we truly lived in a world where nature was based upon survival of the strongest, it would make total sense to say, what's in it for me? What can I get from this decision? Knowing that we live in a world where nature is based on, upon cooperation and what scientists call mutual aid, it makes total sense to shift that question from what can I get to what can I offer? What can I share? What can I contribute or what can I give? What can I give to my community? And so I've just shared one example, a practical example of where one man changed not only his life, but the lives of hundreds of people that now work for him and hundreds, possibly thousands of people that now benefit from the ability to grow their own food. And I got to tell you, this, uh, these things are year round. I was out of the country December and January of 2019. And we did no maintenance on these are covered gardens, self-heating, self-watering covered gardens. We came home and uh, in late January, my wife said, well, the gardens are probably dead, but I'm going to go out and look. They were so alive that the, the plants were pushing up against the covers, sorrel lettuce and I mean, all kinds of lettuce and string beans and they had grown all through the broccoli. They'd grown all through the, the wow. cold weather. So Ken has now helped a lot of people to take care of themselves in a really, really responsible way. And, that's and we all know the, the power behind organic vegetables. And sure. I think it's going to get back to farming. Um, you know, it, you mentioned evolution before. And i and, and talking about Darwin and how so much was based on Darwin, but then so much has been based on the theory of evolution. But you had a great rebuttal or you refute it and I, I, what, describe, talking about lucky biology lucky physics yeah. i'd love to hear you get into it because i think it speaks to how we really are much smaller than we think we are but then we're also really connected in a greater way than we think we are but can you explain this to us sure kevin I, i'd be happy to i'm just going to acknowledge we're really covering a lot of ground here and yeah. and maybe not doing justice to some of the topics in the brief time because they're yeah. if this is new to people they're saying like what you know so so i'm just acknowledging that and uh, i want people to know that if they're interested in more of these things they can go to the youtube channel we've got all kinds of videos i've got uh, go to my website got all kinds of books on on each of these topics i wanted to talk about evolution i'll be really clear uh, i believe in evolution i'm a geologist by degree an earth scientist and i've seen Evolution in the fossil record, plants, definitely, animals, definitely, insects, definitely. Here's where it gets interesting. Darwin's theory of evolution breaks down when it comes to us humans. And it always has. Uh, and there has always been pushback from 1859 when he first offered the theory. And 
um, in uh, my book called uh, Human by Design. I, I have probably three pages, uh, at least three pages, of statements from scientists of the day who were, were pushing back on his theory. There's never been any physical evidence, fossilized evidence, to support our relationship to primitive forms of life. When you go to the evolutionary trees, you'll see us, modern humans, and you see these lines that go down to Neanderthal and Australopithecus and things like that. If you look closely, the lines typically are broken lines because they are, uh, are theorized. They are believed relationships that are believed to be true, yet we've never found the evidence. And when you ask, they say, well, we just haven't looked in the right place. So for 150 years, with the best minds, the best universities, the greatest funding, the greatest technology, if we were on the right track, we would have found one shred of evidence which we have yet to find. That was the state of things until right around 2012. And around the year 2012-ish, we developed the ability to extract DNA from the fossilized remains of ancient forms of life Sounds like uh, the movie Jurassic Park, which was science fiction, which, but now we can actually do that. In the movie, they reconstituted the life. They brought the dinosaurs to life. And to the best of my knowledge, we haven't done that yet. But you know in somebody, some scientific basement, somebody is down there trying to bring this stuff back to life. But here's the point. Now that we have, for example, Neanderthal we are able to extract the DNA from the bone marrow of, uh, of ancient Neanderthal remains. The first one was a baby, an infant, baby girl. And we compared her genome to our genome. And what we could see is first that there's not enough genetic overlap. We did not descend from Neanderthal. We probably shared the earth with them is what scientists are saying. Now we walk the earth with them. We probably interbred. They say, I was at a conference recently and I said, scientifically, we probably had Neanderthal boyfriends and girlfriends. And there was a woman on the front row and she says, I still do. And the guy next to her wasn't laughing at all. So I, there was a whole workshop happening in front of my eyes <laughs> in the event. But this is why if you do a genetic test, you know, 23andMe or, you know, something, Ancestry.com, something like that, people will say, well, I've got Neanderthal DNA. Yes, it is in our genome because we interbred with them, but we did not descend from them. So we know that. That's peer-reviewed science journals like Nature and Science. They are now acknowledging that. But here's where it gets interesting. What we now know from the DNA is that we, okay, we are called anatomically modern humans. The acronym is AMH. So anatomically modern humans appeared suddenly on Earth about 200,000 years ago. The date is not in dispute. Scientists agree on the date. They don't know how it happened. What the DNA is telling us is that we haven't changed in those 200,000 years. If you compare our genome to anatomic, the oldest known anatomically modern humans, it's the same genome. This isn't Darwin's idea of, of slow, gradual change over a long period of time. We showed up fully enabled, fully intact with our uh, the the neurocardiology that we talked about earlier, the extended nervous system, the ability to self-regulate our nervous system, the ability to uh, all of these things with a, a brain 50% larger than our nearest primate relatives. And all of this is attributed to mysterious mutations and a fusion between two chromosomes that cannot be explained through evolution, at least as we know it today. So genes uh, or chromosomes were fused together. Uh, and once they were fused, there were genes that were added, genes that were taken away. They were modified to stabilize that. And these mysterious fusions, they gave us the ability for complex speech, for singing. This is We share 98% of our DNA with a chimpanzee, but you will never hear a chimpanzee sing. You'll never hear, this is my question, why can't a chimpanzee sing Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven? I'm a musician when I'm not doing this. And, and you won't hear it, even though we share 98% of our DNA. So there were a series of mysterious mutations 200,000 years ago. They didn't happen slowly, gradually over a long period of time. The scientific community knows this. They cannot explain it because they, to explain what the evidence suggests, 
leads science into a place that science is reluctant to go into. So rather than allowing the evidence to lead us to the story of our past, the academia, academic community is, is attempting to force the evidence to fit into a pre-existing story that we call ev evolution. So what could be some of the theories? I mean, are you talking to aliens? Are you talking? I mean, well, we don't see that as a scientist, I can't tell. Well, as a scientist, I will tell you this with absolute certainty. We have to say there has been some kind of an intervention in our genome in the ancient past. When we see the fusion, uh, chromosome number seven, for example, uh, was completely stable in all primates. Uh, over 75 million years, it was stable. And then all of a sudden, there was this one little shift in DNA letters that linked our brain to our tongue, to our jaw, that allows us complex speech and the ability to sing. It only happened with us, no other primates. After 75 million years of being stable, it happened exactly 200,000 years ago when we appeared. Chromosome number two, second largest chromosome in the human body. It's responsible for 80% of our neocortex, mirror neurons. Uh, so much of our ability, empathy, sympathy, compassion, the ability to self-regulate our, our biology that we talked about earlier in this program. These are, are uniquely human characteristics. Uh, that are the result of this fusion that happened 200,000 years ago. So as a scientist, I have to say that there's been an intervention. Science will not allow itself to explore the source of that intervention. Now, if you go to indigenous tradition, which is not scientific, but it is pervasive, every indigenous tradition that I have ever studied Everyone, we mentioned some of them earlier in this this broad this program. Not one of them says we're the product of long, slow change over eons of time. All of them say that we are part of a, a much greater community uh, of intelligence that and that we we got lost, essentially, is what they say is is that we we became lost and we long for that connection with our ancestors and with our, our greater community. So how you interpret that, the religious communities will talk about that as, you know, angels and God. And the ancient aliens community interprets that as higher intelligence from another world. And, and there are, you know, many things in between. But the point of all of this is that we're not what we've been told. And we're much more than we've allowed ourselves to acknowledge. And where this is important for me is because we have dormant abilities and latent potentials that can serve us now in our time of extremes that have been denied uh, yes. by the medical and the scientific community. For example, I just give you, I, I mentioned a couple of these. Yeah. I mentioned that we have a neural network in the heart and the brain. We all know about the one in the brain, the one in the heart, relatively new. We're the only form of life Kevin, that can actually take those two neural networks and through a really simple process, we can harmonize them into one single potent system that's called heart-brain coherence. This is done, athletes do this, uh, a lot of major hospitals are, are helping uh, heart patients to do this. There's an organization right there in Northern California pioneering the technology called the Institute of Heart Math, H-E-A-R-T, capital M-A-T-H, it's all one word. I'm not their employee. I've worked with them since the early 90s, since their inception in uh, just outside of Santa Cruz, California. And our ability to harmonize our heart and our brain opens the door. It, it gives us the ability, first of all, to uh, at will, on demand, uh, strengthen our immune response statistically uh, stronger than some antibiotics can do. So at will, on demand, we can create a stronger immune response. Who doesn't want that, you know, in an age of, of the pandemic? Uh, we trigger longevity enzymes and anti-aging enzymes. I've used this technique uh, since I discovered it in 1991, 92, at least once a day. And it has many different applications. The coherence will create resilience to change in our lives, and it reduces stress at the cellular level in our lives. It awakens deep states of intuition, uh, very, uh, I mean, super memory, super cognition, super recall, all kinds of potentials are available to us through these techniques. 
that have been with us for 200,000 years. Right. We, are, we are wired. We are wired for extraordinary potentials. But now our society and academia and science tell us that we are powerless, frail victims. Right. And of, that we need technology and that we just well, this, lean on technology. This is, you know? this, is, this is right where I'm going with this. Right. If you are a victim, you need a savior. And technology is being touted as our savior. Now there is a movement a very powerful movement and policies are being written and laws are being enacted to replace elements of our natural biology that we still don't fully understand, to replace that with artificial polymers, with chemicals in the blood, with computer chips in the brain, with sensors under the skin. And the reason that I am very passionate about this is because we're being told that we need something outside of ourselves to be healthy in our bodies and to be successful in life. And when we, in mass, not talking about a well, one-off, but in mass, when we as a society, if we choose to embrace these technologies, our natural abilities begin to atrophy. Yes. We begin, our body believes that it is no longer needed to produce the immune response or to produce the, the kinds of neurons in the brain because a chip is doing it for us or a chemical is doing it for us. This is how you lose a species. And this is exactly the pushback that we're seeing right now. There is a movement that wants to keep us feeling powerless, keep us feeling that we need something outside of our bodies because others benefit from that. So my passion right now, I, I'm saying, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying at least before we give our humanness away to the technology, let's discover what it is we're giving away. Who are we? And what does it mean to be fully human? And my sense is once we answer those questions for ourselves, we will feel less of an urgency to embrace the technology and less of a need to, to bring that technology into our lives. The movement, I know many people are familiar, it's called the transhuman movement is the, the movement that began in the early 20th century, the thinking, but it didn't have a lot of teeth to it until recently. And now that we have the technology to implement that thinking and that technology is being embraced by industry, by technology, uh, by governmental organizations. Some of them are non-governmental organizations. So I, I just think we owe it to ourselves to be honest. How can we solve the problems if we're not honest about the problems? We are this rare, precious species uh, with a mysterious past. And I'm not saying we don't have to understand the past to benefit from what that past has given to us. But I believe that we owe it to ourselves to maybe for the first time in a long time to embrace what it means to be fully human and to apply that in our lives to become the best version of ourselves and create the best world possible. And that, that's where we're going. And Greg, can we, fi can we finish off by talking yeah. about how the uni you believe the universe, and I agree with you, is alive and conscious sure. in and of itself? Because then that gives us more, sure. I don't know, it should inspire us more to know that we need to serve and we need to work together because we are all connected. Yeah, there's, you know, there is a an, an effort. Well, I think you all know, you and, and our community, there's a there's a battle. We're, we're involved in the battle. There's a battle for our thoughts. That certainly is obvious through the media, the in, in kinds of information we're inundated with. There's a battle for our beliefs, what we believe about ourselves, who we are, where we come from, uh, where the universe came from. There's a battle for our very humanness. And that's what I'm talking about, replacing us with synthetics and technology. The thinking that makes that battle possible is that we are conditioned to believe what's called the standard model. And there's a fight to hang on to the standard model. The standard model says that we're the product of a dead universe. The universe began with this primal release of energy, an inert explosion uh, through amazingly lucky physics. We happen to be on just the right planet, just the right size, just the right sun, just the right distance from the sun. Big Bang the right Theory, the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that whole thing. Well, what the new science is showing is that the universe appears to be alive, intelligent, and conscious. And they first began, it was the Hubble Space Telescope that started sending back some of these images. And now the James Webb has superseded that. 
for example, they've seen now entire galaxies when they are threatened with something like, uh, you know, a, an energetic pulse from a, a star that's going to hurt that galaxy. The galaxy will actually create a jet from the center of the galaxy that will propel it. It will move it out of harm's way from that that pulse that's coming through. And they found one of these. They said, well, maybe it's a one off. And now if you you can go to the NASA website, you can see image after image of of galaxies that are consciously shifting their position to avoid incoming incoming threats that, that could hurt or, or destroy you know, the galaxy itself. So we also know that there's a field of energy that underlies and connects everything through what is now called entanglement. So we've gone from thinking the universe is dead. Now we, and I'm not saying all physicists are on board with this. This is just where the evidence is, is leading. So we live in a universe that's alive, it's conscious, it's intelligent. And now we've gone from thinking of us as the product of lucky biology and random mutations that just happen to occur in just the right way at just the right time to recognizing that there appears to be some kind of an intelligent intervention underlying our existence. Who or what that is, is that's where the debate is. That's the controversy. And it depends on what lens you want to look at it through. You've got to think beyond religion. You've got to think beyond science because there's something bigger where both of these come together. And I think, again, we owe it to ourselves to honor 5,000 years of, of human history, oral traditions. What did they know that we've forgotten? Or what did they know that we've never understood? And to honor the best science of the modern world. But science is only 300 years old. It's new. It's a new way of thinking. So when we weave these together, we give ourselves the evolutionary edge so that we can transcend our time of extremes in a way that other civilizations where they may have failed. If we lock ourselves in only and say, we're only gonna look at a scientific perspective that will not acknowledge anything that it can't see or measure, or we lock ourselves into a spiritual perspective that discounts all of the, the mechanism the science is showing us, that's where we, that's where we get stuck in the thinking. And it, and I'll be the first to acknowledge, Kevin, uh, it takes a lot of work to change the way we think. And a lot of what we're talking about is it's a different way of thinking for, think, for many people. I think the micro on the micro level, it starts with serve having being in a uh, mode of service. You know, what, what purpose can I serve rather than what can I take from this life? And then I think also it's realizing that we are all connected, like you said, with yeah. nature. And and I love this idea, this concept, which makes sense to me. That's really more about cooperation than it is about uh, overpowering, you know, weaker species or weaker things around us. Well, I agree. You know, from, I mean, many people, how many people have the luxury to do what we're doing right now and to spend uh, time in the day to talk about this? Most people are trying to make ends meet, taking care yeah. of their families, their kids. Yes. So when, when we have this conversation, it's an invitation. How would you live your life if you understood, if you knew that you are the product of a living, conscious, and intelligent universe? First of all, where life is the norm rather than the exception, and that we are the product of an intelligent gift. Something was given to us 200,000 years ago, and we have abilities and extraordinary potentials at our fingertips that we're only beginning to understand that makes life much easier, helps us to become the best version of ourselves to create the best world possible. And when, when we kind of shift our thinking into that modality, that's the invitation then to begin to explore. And, and different people are drawn to different things. Some people are drawn, what do you mean? You know, the universe is is intelligent and and that will be their path and other people will say well what do you mean we didn't descend from neanderthal and that'll be their path and other people say well what do you mean i can strengthen my own immune system without a vaccine or without a drug or without a chemical which are all available when we need it and and i'm happy to use them when they're necessary but they discount our own natural abilities, and we stand to lose those abilities if we don't use them. That's, this is the, you hear this in biology a lot, use it or lose it. 
So we, uh, I believe we owe it to ourselves. We lose it and then we lose the species, like you said, because well, how, we, how, we become, if AI, if AI comes in, how is what the way it's coming? How can it not take over? How can well, it this not is, be this, this is the whole Kevin, this, this is the whole point. The transhuman movement proposes by the year 20, this is Ray Kurzweil, uh, director of uh, technology at Google, who is openly stating by the year 2035, we will not see pure human any longer. We will be a hybrid of technology, computer chips, sensors, and artificial intelligence. Here's, here's what's being taught to our young people in school, is that we are a flawed species, that, that carbon-based life, that's us, is a flawed species. And among our flaws are our abilities to have emotion and sentimentality. Uh, because they cloud our perceptions and they cloud our logic. This is this is the thinking. But what's missing here and what uh, the technologists are not talking about is when we begin to replace our natural biology with synthetics and polymers and computer chips. Again, first of all, our bodies will shut down the natural processes. The brain won't produce the neurons that it produces if it feels like it doesn't need them. The body won't produce... The, the, the systems, including the immune system, because something else is doing it for us. The, we're already seeing this in young children, uh, three years old, four years old, with the AI visors, where they are immersed in, uh, in simulation or virtual realities, you know, for hours during the day. Here's what's happening. They are seeing these extraordinary visual scenes and and colors and sounds and situations that they would never see in their backyard. The key is it's all being done for them. So they are not using their imagination. They're not uh, engaged in creating. They are observing and watching. And so now what's happening is they are having cognitive issues, cognitive disabilities. There's a thickening of the, the visual cortex, first of all, uh, in these young children. They are lacking in social skills, certainly, mm -hmm. but they are they're actually stunted in their cognitive development and even in some cases in the physical development because their bodies are just sitting there watching. They're not engaged. So all of these uh, this is so new and the technology is happening so quickly and it's being really sexy marketing. I mean, I'm I'm enticed. It's made to look really, really good uh, and nowhere. You don't see this in the mainstream. Are we being taught about our natural potential or our natural abilities? But last thing I want to say here, this is because I've had technologists come to my events and they say, you know, Greg, we can't compete with a computer chip. Are computer chips fast? Absolutely. Are they efficient? Absolutely. But here's the thing that is so really beautiful. A computer chip is limited by the physics of the stuff it's made of. It cannot go beyond the, the processing capability of uh, silicon, for example, and the, the spacing between the atoms or the, the CPU, the central processing unit for, for that uh, particular uh, piece of technology. What is being discovered now is that human biology is scalable. Our neurons, we don't know how far they can scale, how much information they are able to, to hold and transmit because every time we think we reach a limit, our biology adapts and compensates for that limit and gives us more bandwidth. And the same with the cell membranes on our bodies. We literally are a highly advanced, technolo technologically sophisticated, soft technology that we self-regulate through thought, feeling, emotion, belief, breath, and focus. And we begin to think of ourselves that way. In the presence of the challenges we have in the world, I think it helps us. My experience is, and we have all the details to support this, my experience is that it empowers us uh, to feel much stronger in the face of the challenges that come to us today, rather too. than feeling afraid and weak, because we solve the problems from the love of who we are, rather than the fear of what we're going to lose. And that's the key. And the next time you come on, we'll talk about how fear can program our biology. I, I, yeah. and, and as I let you go, I want to, I know we, 
I feel like there's a lot of doom and gloom we covered. We honestly identified conditions in the world. I don't think it's gloom and doom because, because the unsustainable ways of thinking and living have to collapse to give way to a higher order. It takes one generation. It has to be a generation that lives that old way and experiences that collapse while building the new world. And that's who we are today. It's a rare and precious moment, the opportunity to actually contribute to a new world that's emerging. And the question is, do we build that world from the fear of what we think we're going to lose, or do we build it from the love of what we know is possible and what our potential mm -hmm. is? So you and I covered some of those potentials uh, just scraping the surface. There's so much more that we can go into. But for me, the, the good news is we're made for this. We're wired for this. This is why we're here. And if you're here in this world right now, it has to be to bridge these two ways of knowing. I can't think of a more exciting time. I can't think of a better a better way to spend our day than exploring what this means yeah. and uh, to opening the door to a deep appreciation for what it means to be human and who we are as a family and as a community. So I, I want to thank of, you. Yeah. Move out of love over fear. I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. Well, this was amazing. Greg, go do your things. We're going to promote you on our post show and in our intro, but thank you so much. And we'll, we'll definitely have to keep, keep this conversation going. Kevin, I look forward to our next. I know we had some tech issues. I think we we manned through those pretty well. Oh, we and it's a, a pleasure to work with you. We'll thank you, my fine. dear friend. And I want to just thank our community for all you're doing thank to be you. the best version of yourself. I look forward to our next. Me too. Thanks, Greg. Okay, Kelsey. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was I need to take there. I need to take a lap and then come back and re-listen to it. There's a like that was a lot. Yeah. I mean, I feel yeah. Listen, I I usually do err on the side of positive, but um, mm. yeah, I don't know. I don't see a lot. I just don't, the way it's going, I just think uh, whatever reason human beings are here, we've had a phenomenal run. Mm. I say men were like the New England Patriots, had a great run. White men in general, great run. It's over. Now I'm starting to think maybe human beings – just a New in England Patriots. <laughs> Phenomenal run on the planet for 200,000 years, but I don't know. I think with, I think, but by saying that, right, maybe we can awaken people to a greater consciousness, to know we are connected, to know that uh, we're connected to our fellow person out there, uh, whether we get along with them or not, whether we agree with them or we don't, um, and that. We really do need to shift our brains more to serving rather than being served. And uh, so hopefully, you know, this motivates everyone to do that. Because I think that that ultimately can, 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 can save us. Yeah. I got phenomenal run. Great <laughs> if run. If not, we had a, we had a, we had a lot of fun. Kelsey, I, would, I got a longer run than you. But you had a pretty good run too. Come I did. On. I did. Yeah. Great you know college what? life, sorority. Yeah. Come on. I mean, 29 years. <laughs> it's a good run. But I do have to say, it made me think like I, it's just my nature now. I go to my Instagram, I go to my TikTok, I go to whatever, and understanding like his line about being fully human and, you know, you want, you're not going to give your, give yourself away to the technology when you fully embrace being human. I was like, Hmm, that's going to make me think now Greg's going to be in the back of my head when I just, yeah. you know, and maybe not pop on there. Maybe when you have sons, daughters, nieces, and nephews, you don't slap a VR mask <laughs> on them at two or three. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I, but you know, we didn't, he cut me off cause he had some, he's got a big media day and I understand, but I want you guys to Google affirmative prayer. Hmm. Because it's something that he does talk about and he yeah, does preach. But no, no, affirmative prayer. Mm, it's a different kind of prayer. Good. And I think it's praying, and again, ties into Joe Dispenza and all the other things. And again, I please look it up as I'm going off no sleep and looking at tons of research really fast. It's the backup quarterback who's out of shape sitting on the sidelines with his headset and his clipboard, not ready to be called into action. So Forgive me, I'm trying to get back in game shape here. That being said, his affirmative prayer, I, it's something in effect that 
uh, rather than praying for something to happen, it's, it's, it's praying in a way where you're giving gratitude that it already did happen, I think. But give it a look. And he, he talks about a fifth mode of prayer. And the only reason I say I wanted to end the interview with that is because I did want to give you hope. And for what you can do, yes, by serving, knowing we're all connected, that's going to help. But then what do you do internally for you? So give Affirmative Prayer a Google, and then um, yeah, maybe we'll have him back and just do a show based on that. I, you know what? He'd be a good Monday uh, motivation and tension. Simply on the first, you know what, Kelsey, have him come back if he will, and simply focus ten minutes on affirmative prayer. Okay, I think it'd be a really powerful um, Monday uh, motivation intention. And uh, if you don't know about that show, it's available on Apple Podcasts. It's on a separate feed. Monday motivations and intentions. They're anywhere from two to ten minutes, and um, we have experts from all over give you um, some great practices that you can do on your Mondays uh, to get you make your week, your day better, your week better, your month better, hopefully your life better. So anyway, all right. Well, Kelsey, that's that. That's um, that. I'm going to try and process all of this. <laughs> Me too. You did a great job though, Kev. Uh, we did all right. All we have to, what, what do I have to say, Kelsey? Just all we got to do is keep the team alive, keep our playoff hopes alive, which I just have to go 500. That's all. Just have that's to, it. just have to win as many as I lose. <laughs> and hold us in until Brady comes back. Um, all right, Kelsey, what do you all say on this show? We say be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.